Thanks, Hutch. It is, uh, I can't express what a joy it is to serve alongside of Hutch and Ted. Um, Ted is uh, out of town this morning, actually. He and Janine are at a wedding, or were at a wedding yesterday, a uh, family wedding in California. And they're going to be flying back to uh, Colorado Springs tomorrow um, to spend time with Janine's sister and, and brother-in-law. And so you pray for them, for safe traveling, mercies for them. And uh, he expressed two things this morning, one for Hutch to keep me in line, and then also uh, just how much he missed being here. It's just not the same for him um, when, he's, when he's away. So we all know Ted uh, tirelessly uh, works around here and um, shows us all up in, in our service <laughs> to the Lord. And so it's, uh, his presence is, is certainly missed. Um, would you turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 4? We're going to finish out Ephesians 4 uh, this morning in our series, Repurposed. Uh, We're going to see uh, five or seven-ish, depending on how you kind of divide these out, character qualities of kingdom living. And we could easily say character qualities of the repurposed life. Um, Very practical words for us this morning, if you'll read with me. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 25, going through the end of the chapter. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. But rather, let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, We could could take each one of these uh, imperatives and preach a week on each one very easily. And so we're going to work through the text Quickly this well, somewhat quickly this morning, um, and let me just ask that you would open up your heart for God to do the restorative work that He desires to do in your heart in these areas. He says there that we're members of one another, right? and that this community, this called-out group of people, is to live different than any other group of people in existence. And so these very, very specific, very uh, practical areas of our lives have got to be different. And so last week we were urged to take off our old way of living, right? We talked about this dirty t-shirt, right? With its passions and behaviors, we were told to take it off, right? Like a dirty, nasty, sweaty shirt and put on this new life, to put on Christ. Paul's telling us this morning that there's some conduct that needs to just simply be put away. Right? Burn it, right? Like an old t-shirt. Put it away. Walk away from it. Right? Some tendencies we have in our everyday interactions uh, that we need to take off like dirty laundry, but he doesn't leave us hanging. He doesn't tell us to clean up our dirty laundry. He doesn't say, you know, Christianize it. He doesn't say, clean up your life and just do better. It's not what he's telling us here, right? He doesn't tell us to just clean this up, but to put on something so much better, so much more beautiful, so much more life-giving, that communicates hope and grace to those around us. Right? And so we see these character qualities of kingdom living or character qualities of the repurposed life. 
right? I think most of us would say, I don't have an issue with lying. Anybody want to confess they have an issue with lying this morning? Right, no one wants to confess it, right? But maybe some of us have that issue. But I think if we look at these words, speak the truth with your neighbor, right? That, that brings it down another level. Like that, that I struggle with, right? To speak the truth with my neighbor, that can be more of a challenge. Right? It's one thing to simply um, keep our mouths closed, right? But it's another thing to actually speak the truth, right? In a loving, compassionate manner to our neighbor. We don't uh, want to embellish the truth, right? We don't want to leave out key aspects of the truth. We want to rightly represent the truth, with our neighbor, you know, a neighbor biblically is one, anyone that you're in contact with on a regular basis, anybody. Right, neighbor uh, here is referring to somebody even closer, maybe someone next to you this morning, maybe someone in this room, or somebody that might typically be here, like maybe Pastor Ted, right? Right, Paul, in giving us this reason behind what he's saying, he says, therefore, we are members of one another. Paul is specifically talking about our conduct in the church, right? We're told in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, we know this, right? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things, right? Which means that I'm obligated to trust what you tell me because you're my brother or you're my sister in Christ. I'm obligated. In the church, it can be very easy for people to be offended, and at Pillar Stafford, we really strive for unity. Um, Hutch was teaching our Next Steps class this morning to some people. And the class, uh, it's the class that we require for anybody to become a member here at, at, at uh, Pillar Stafford. And we quote in the Next Steps a quote from Augustine who said, An essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Love, right? That's the culture that we have to have here at Pillar Stafford. And that, I think, is the culture of what Paul is, is laying out here in Ephesians, right? There's so much to say, you know, on this, but our ability to speak the truth to one another is essential to our effectiveness and to our unity as a church, if you're easily offended by the, listen to this, if you're easily offended by the things another church member is saying to you, then you're simply not loving them well. You're not embodying that 1 Corinthians 13, 7. But if you're the person that seems to constantly be offended, then you're probably not loving your brothers and sisters well either. It's this two-way street. Right? Speaking the truth in love is a mark of Christian maturity. Right? It comes from one who allows the Spirit of God to redeem their posture towards one another, redeem their vocabulary, the words that we may use, but also the Spirit of God to redeem our, even our inflection in the way that we say things. That it would fill that person with grace and mercy and compassion and truth. And so we ask ourselves, is, is that how I interact with people here? Let's even make it a little step harder. <laughs> Is that how I interact with my spouse and my children? Kids answering back there? So let's go. <laughs> I hope not. Right? Hopefully my kids aren't answering. Um, you know, but then secondly, right, Paul is telling us in these character qualities of kingdom life, right, to put off sinful anger, right, in verses 26 and 27, to put off sinful anger and put on Righteous affection. When we read the words, be angry and do not sin, we become confused. <laughs> right? Like, how is that possible? I don't understand how that's possible. 
it seems like my anger is often, or it is that my anger is often or always connected to my sin. In ways it seems hard to understand how Paul could say these words. That we could be angry and yet not sin. You know, and we have all, all ways that we make excuses for ourselves, right? For our angry uh, reactions, right? To one another, to people in our family, to our children, to our coworkers, to our difficult neighbors. Some of my neighbors are here, I gotta be careful. But seriously, you know, we have all these reasons that we give for why we can't seem to control ourselves, right? And so uh, then the phrase there, which is great for us, right? Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Right? And we say, well, how much time do I have left, right? You know, or I don't have my phone on me. That's what we don't look at watches typically anymore, right? And it's like, you know, man, I wish I lived in Sweden, where they don't have a sunset for like six months of the year. Like, that's got to be great to live in Sweden. You know, I got five months, six, you know, 23 days and whatever. You know, obviously this isn't what Paul has in mind here. You know, what he's really getting at is that the longer we're angry with someone, the more opportunity we give Satan to tempt us to sin in our anger. Right, so what's the safest bet? Let it go quickly. Let it go. Because the gospel's plenty big enough to swallow up your sinful anger. Which is generally or always rooted in our own pride. Now, there is a such thing as righteous anger, right? We know that because there is somebody that is righteous, right? And he has anger, right? And so there's this idea of righteous anger, like when Jesus overturned the money changers' tables. We all remember that. Oftentimes we quote that in our excuse for our own anger and outbursts, you know, which is not right, you know. But think about God's anger that burns against our sin, right? And so the gospel starts to come into view here. Right? Think about this kind of anger that burns against our sin. Surely God's anger is righteous because he's righteous, right? And nothing unrighteous can be in him or come out of him, right? But even though God's anger is righteous and holy, he's long-suffering. Beautiful words of Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. This is the Old Testament God, okay? <laughs> full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering. Are you long-suffering? Plenteous in mercy and truth. That's our God. That's our God. It's not that he's angry at sin and, and will rightly judge sin, but that he is long-suffering. Full of grace and mercy, he judged your sin in the body of Jesus. That's the truth of the gospel. He is just in judging sin, yet he's also the justifier that makes us right and forgives us through Jesus. He's our model. So listen, when we're angry, maybe even rightly, when somebody sins against us or sins against God, and that makes us angry. That's righteous anger, although we don't experience that too frequently. <laughs> but it's where we go with that. Even righteous anger can be followed up by sinful actions because we're sinful beings. So we can rest in the one who will right all wrongs in our anger, right? The gospel is the fire extinguisher to my anger towards others. Rightly seeing my own sin and the way that Jesus dealt with me, not in angry judgment, but in kindness, taking my punishment on his body uh, compels me to treat others in similar fashion. 
It's not that we excuse sin and just look the other way. We own sin and look to Jesus who dealt with that sin for us. The gospel frees me from this sinful anger that I'm so prone to express. The way that it works for us to be angry but not to sin, I think, and this is not scripture, this is my thinking here, I think is in the moment that we find ourselves angry first to stop talking. (laughs) I always get myself into trouble when I talk and I'm angry, always. That's why Anna says, why are you not talking? Because I'm going to sin, you know, because I don't need to be talking right now. And so, because I can talk in every other situation forever. Like, if you're quiet, there's something wrong. And No, it's all right. Just, yeah, just stay there. You're fine. So one, stop talking. Two, do right thinking in that moment. Do right thinking in that moment. Ask yourself the question, why am I actually angry here? Don't just give yourself a pass, right? Oh, it's righteous anger. Like, eh, probably not. Why am I angry right now? Right? Is it righteous? Is it because they've sinned against me or God? Or do I just not like what they're doing right now? Do I not like who they are? Are they just annoying to me, irritating to me? I really don't like that person right now. Somebody say yes. And then thirdly, (laughs) reenact the gospel. Reenact the gospel, right? Ask yourself, how can I be a picture of the gospel to this person that I'm angry at right now? How can I be a picture of who Jesus is, what he's done to this person right now? How can I be Jesus to this person right now, the one that you're angry at? Because how did Jesus treat the people, me and you, that he was angry at? How did Jesus treat his enemies? He died for them. He died for his enemies and made them right. (laughs) How can I be Jesus to this person that I'm angry at right now? Third characteristic, put off stealing and put on hospitality. Or in other words, don't steal, work and give. Verse 28, right? The gospel converts our selfish entitlement and turns it into hospitality. The gospel converts our selfish entitlement, right? I'm gonna take what's not mine. I'm entitled to it. It's mine, give it to me. And changes that into hospitality. For the thief, right, certainly they're to stop stealing, Right, so if that's you, come talk to us. We'll call the authorities. No, we actually have some of the authorities right here in our church. We'll just point you to. No. But for the thief, it's certainly there to stop stealing what doesn't belong to them. Right? But even more than that, they're to put on Christ's behavior uh, that reflect this inward transformation that's going on, gone on in their hearts. Right? I can remember friends in high school, or in junior high school especially, I in junior high school had issues with stealing stuff fishing equipment like a weirdo, but I had friends that were stealing like DVD, well, probably not DVD players, probably uh, VHS players or whatever they were back then, you know, but stealing stuff like that, you know, and and so I get that, but I think, you know, even more taking another step, you know, it's true that a worker is worthy of their hire, and that if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, right? But Paul takes this, I think, a bit further. He's telling us that a Christian is to live a life that works so that they are not only providing for their family's needs, but can actually be a blessing and a mirror of grace or a mirror of the gospel to others in need. And so it takes this kind of sometimes seemingly mundane act of every Monday through Friday or whenever your work schedule is to go to this, you know, quote unquote, secular job. And it helps us understand that, no, that is actually God's providence and calling in your life right now. This is part of God's mission in your life right now is to work that he will provide for you and your family through this paycheck. But then it's also his mission to use that as a picture of his goodness and grace and mercy to others in your life. This new life that we have in Christ, this new self, 
that we've put on in Ephesians 4.24, right, looks less like taking and more like giving. It looks less like taking advantage of others or using others to get what we want and more like arranging our lives to meet others' needs. More like rearranging our lives to meet others' needs. Fourth, put off corrupt talk and put on constructive encouragement. And I feel like this is like the most (laughs) practical character quality of a repurposed life is the way that we use these words that come out of our mouths. The way that we use them in our interactions with each other, with our spouses, with our children, right, with those out in our community and those all around us in our church. I mean, our words, our inflection, right? I mean, just the way that we talk, the things that we talk about, the way that we point things out to people, it betray us. It, it, they, these words betray us that we are, in fact, Sinners in need of serious redemption. So the gospel moves us from using our words to hurt and tear down to using our words to give grace and build up those around us. Constructive encouragement. When we're drawing from the deep well of gospel truth, we begin to see the words of God in the Bible as beautiful, sweet, and life-giving, right? The gospel, God's word about who Jesus is and what he accomplished on our behalf and the life that he offers us by faith transforms the way that we talk. Not in speaking these little Christian cliches that we have, right? But something much deeper. Something much deeper, right? And so the word for corrupt in the Greek carries the idea of rotten, putrid, filthy. It's like biting into an apple that looks good on the outside. You ever done this? Bite into it and it's just soft and sour on the inside. Maybe you get the worm that was in it or something. You know, and we say yuck, right? But that is how often our words are to other people. They're not good for their intended purpose. It's not satisfying and life-giving, right? It's not sweet. It's rotten and needs to just be thrown in the trash. I used to use my words constantly to put other people down. I can remember as a, I think, a junior in high school, I'd hurt a lot of my friends by my words I was always ready for a debate, always ready for an argument. I listened to all the such and such a kind of political news and I was ready to fight about, you know, pointless issues really. You know, and I had a friend um, and she came to me and said, you know, Garland, you've really offended a lot of our friends. In the way that you talk to them, the way you put them down, you're always sarcastic. And it's just really caused a lot of pain. And I did not receive that well. But she was absolutely right. And so can you believe, like very soon thereafter, I don't, you know, I don't even remember what the date is today, let alone how many weeks after that it was. But my youth pastor taught on this portion of scripture in Ephesians. And I can remember it was just like God taking a knife, just going right into my heart. He was like, this is you, man. This is you. And so as a junior in high school, sitting in youth group that night, God broke me. And he began, he hadn't finished it yet, but he began to redeem the way that I talk to people. And so Kristen's words, you know, rang true in my head and in my heart. I knew she was right. And God began to cut that stuff out. And that's kind of painful. I've got to own up to this. Okay, I'm a jerk. 
And I'm all about myself. It's all about my pride, making myself look better. And I use my words to make, sh- make sure that everybody knows I'm concerned about, you know, logic and I want to argue, and I'm a junior in high school, I want to argue about, you know, your faulty logic when it comes to this issue and blah, 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 like just foolish, immature, and hurtful. But how about you? Are your words building people up around you? Are they encouraging them in their faith in Christ? Are your words seen as loving and sweet like Jesus? (laughs) Are they often, do they often sting and just hurt a little bit? You know, sometimes we can be so sarcastic But then we laugh at the end, right? Ha, ha, you know, we're just joking. And the person's like, man, that kind of stung. Like, what? Are your words sour to those that hear? Like that apple? Are they always negative? Just a little cutting? Or are we always making ourselves try to look better? Are we always one-upping those that we're talking to? Right? Nobody's done anything as cool as I have. Right? Guys are famous for this stuff. Right? Are you so concerned about precision of words that we're always correcting people? These are just my thoughts. You know, sure, we're not cussing. Right? Let no corrupt word. I don't cuss. I kicked that habit a long time ago. I'm not cussing. My words aren't corrupt. He's talking about something so much deeper, right? He's not just talking about cussing and inappropriate language which he mentions in chapter 5. But are our words life-giving and sweet? Are our words being used to communicate the gospel and word and deed? Do your words communicate judgment? Or do they rightly communicate God's grace shown through Jesus? We often justify hurting, uh, saying hurtful things by quoting, right? Speak the truth in love. I gotta speak the truth. In love, it's loving to speak the truth. Right? We justify saying this hurtful thing because it's the truth and it's loving to speak the truth, right? That's not what he's saying. You know, and so, you know, as I think about this in my own life, I'm guilty of all this stuff. I, I think we've got to consider when we're about to say something to somebody and we see that it's truth, right, and we think it might be hard to hear, right? we've got to ask ourselves, you know, do I have the kind of relationship with this person or do I have uh, the relational equity with this person where they're actually going to hear my words because they know I care about them? Because you might be able to say something to your best friend that you can't just say to somebody you, have, you really have no relationship with. Are they going to hear my words of truth in a manner that is actually going to be helpful, right? Building up. Do they trust me enough to say these words? Be slow to speak, quick to listen, right? And so sometimes people aren't just, uh, are, are just not very self-aware about the things that they're saying or their tone of voice, right? Even though they don't uh, mean to be hurtful, can often be hurtful. Right? The gospel helps us care for others by evaluating what we're going to say. Because we want our words to be consistent. That word axios, you know, consistent, uh, worthy of Christ, worthy, uh, consistent with the gospel. We want our words to be that way. I wouldn't say that I learned this lesson for good. You know, I still catch myself even in the tone of my voice saying things to cause hurt, embarrassment, maybe to get a point across passive aggressively. You know, the other day or often, I will say something cutting to my wife, the one I love the most in this world. I'll say, who left the lights on downstairs when she had just come upstairs, you know? And she's like, I'll go turn them off. No, no, I'll, I'll go turn them off. I'll go turn them off. You know, like, 
She's like, I'm up and down these stairs 15 times a day doing laundry and, uh, and you're going to get on me for spending the, you know, whatever, 18 cents of electricity that it's going to cost or probably three cents. John Blakemore could do the math for us real quick and tell us how, how much if I told him the lights and how much they burn. But, you know, like that's the kind of stuff. And so is God redeeming this sharp tongue, James says? In the context of Pillar Stafford, right? This is serious stuff. Do you use your words to build up and encourage your brothers and sisters? Do you use your words to complain about things you don't like? Do you use your words to tear down church culture, especially in a new church, is very fragile? Clint Clifton has reminded us of that many times. You have a say in the culture here. By the way that you interact with one another, the way that you either love one another well or don't affects our culture as a church and oftentimes it's seen just in the way that we use our words, right? So church culture is fragile if we want our church culture to be encouraging and life-giving a model of the gospel, then we have got to evaluate our words and put off the old stinky shirt of corrupt talk, put on the new way of helpful, life-giving, encouraging conversation with one another. And then lastly, put off, we see here resentment, anger, rage, and slander. Put on kindness, compassion, and grace. Paul starts his last statement in chapter four with the words, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, right? There's a way of living for the Christian that literally grieves God, the Holy Spirit. It causes the Holy Spirit to mourn, to grieve the death that is seeping out of our mouths towards one another. It's, the closely, it's closely connected to, is that not interesting? I've never seen that before. I've kind of always had that little phrase stood off on its own. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. But literally that the words of my mouth, the way that I treat you, the way that I treat my wife and children, the way that I treat my brother Ted and Hutch is what oftentimes grieves the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me and is redeeming me and making me new. The Holy Spirit grieves this dead life still lived out, and right? we still live out this dead life, right? As we're believers, this stench of rotting, putrid, corrupt talk expressed in words of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice, right? That this stench rises to the nostrils of our great God and Savior and King, and the Spirit grieves when we live that way, tearing one another down. And so this list of qualities of the old self, right? The old dead self, this dead walk, conduct of life, right? Have no place in the life of a person who's been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is no longer dead, but is alive and redeemed. And so bitterness, right? Sour spirit or resentful attitude. Secondly, wrath and anger, judgmentalism, festering anger, always ready to fight, clamor, outbursts of anger, blow ups and yelling, slander, abusive language, right? Statements that are false and damaging to someone else's character. Malice is hostility. This can't be in our church. This can't be in my life. And if it is, I need brothers around me that rebuke me. And this can't be in our church. If we want to have true gospel-centered culture that communicates love and grace and hope and peace that we have in God, we can't treat each other like this. I feel like these are a summation of what he's already said. These are three essential character qualities of kingdom living. I'm going to try to get through this really quick. 
None of this good behavior has at its roots and origin in us, right? It's all produced in our lives as, like we saw in 317, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. He has to do the work, right? The, nat- the natural, unregenerate heart cannot be truly kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving as Christ is forgiving. We are not able to uh, just be on our best behavior, right? That's not what he's communicating. But we have to be rooted and grounded in Christ, allowing him to change our hearts from the inside, affecting what comes out of our mouths, causing us to take off our old ways of thinking and living, causing us to love his words and his ways and put on this new way of thinking, of believing and loving. Right? We want the kind of life walk, right? this conduct of life that he's talking about, that the Spirit can celebrate rather than grieve. That the Spirit of God living inside of you celebrates the things that are coming out of your mouth because they're consistent with who he is rather than grieving the way that we're treating one another. Right? So first, being kind to one another, the gospel of Jesus Christ frees you to be kind in the face of adversity. It allows you to love those that in our own flesh are hard to love. His gospel, that he loved me, his enemy. While I was yet a sinner, he died for me. Right? That he's not given me what I deserve. We call it grace. He's uh, not giving us what I do deserve, which is called mercy, in this place called hell. Right? So now uh, this truth urges me to be kind to those other undeserving sinners like me. So the gospel humbles me. It lowers my nose, brings me all the way down where everybody else is already, where I am. I just don't recognize it sometimes. And allows me to respond in kindness because Jesus has responded to me. In kindness. Secondly, being tender hearted, we could substitute the word compassionate, right? The gospel that Jesus looked on me with compassion rather than judgment that I deserved is why I can be compassionate to other undeserving sinners like myself. I can actually be empathetic and compassionate when I'm humbled before God, understanding my need, my constant need for my Savior to continue to do this work in my heart affecting the way that I live and talk and the things that I value. It allows me to love those people that maybe have gotten themselves into this mess, right? Just like me, got myself into this mess. Gospel compassion compels me to listen to the hurt of others. Not make excuses as to why they're there but to listen to the hurt of others, to stop stop talking and just listen. It compels me to listen to the hurt of the African-American community. It compels me to care for the immigrating Mexican that's just trying to feed his family. It compels me These are just my thoughts, right? It compels me in my life to listen to the women of our day that have been hurt and abused by men in Hollywood, right? In the church, in our societies, and in families. This compassion of the gospel helps me close my mouth and lets me listen to other people But this gospel-centered compassion compels me to listen. Like, let's take it down another step more practically. To help those that are in need right here and in our church, right? Gospel-centered compassion compels me to clear my schedule when somebody else is going through a hard time. Like, I was going to do this and this and this. Like, this guy is more important. This lady's going through a hard time. And I know she needs somebody to just listen. We can't fix it, right? 
but to listen and show that person that I value you. You're my brother. You're my sister. I love you. And, oh, I thought you had this thing going on. Well, I did, but I, but I moved some things around because I know you needed to spend time with me and with the Lord. Gospel compassion compels me to spend time listening to my brothers and sisters, right? Praying, crying with them, right? Reading scripture together and even worshiping, right? Through song together. Gospel-centered compassion allows me to take time out of my day to sit and listen to my wife. And I gotta set my phone aside, close my computer, like I'm so easily distracted. Like we went to a restaurant last night and she had me face right to the wall. You know, nobody else, I can't see anything else going on, you know. But the gospel compels me to give my wife the attention that she certainly has earned (laughs) from me and all the stuff that she does for our family. But to love her, even when my day might be going crazy. Gospel compassion compels me to stop and listen to what's going on in my kids' lives. To listen, stop. Well, I'm not concerned about, you know, like you're not in trouble. Like I tell my kids, like you're not going to get in trouble for anything you tell me right now. I just want to know how you're doing. I'm like, really? Is this a trick? Is it, you know? I'm like, maybe, but no. But like, The gospel drives us to this kind of life. (laughs) Where I'm actually more concerned about my relationship with those people than being right. And then thirdly, forgiving one another, right? The gospel here in verse 32 is God in Christ forgave you, right? All of this whole passage, I feel like this whole book is tethered to this truth of the gospel. (laughs) That God in Christ forgave. God, not just, but in Christ, right, through what he did, through Jesus, in and through Jesus, dying for you, making you right, only in him, by faith as you trust in him for your salvation, right? He gives you the power to forgive others because he has forgiven you of so much more than this other person has done to you. The way we need to be is quick to admit wrong quick to ask forgiveness, and quick to forgive. If we do all this, we will continue to experience and grow together in the unity that we already have here. And continue to grow in unity and kingdom fruitfulness, right? All of this is tethered to those final words. It's fitting as we prepare for communion as God in Christ forgave you. Because Christ forgave me, I can keep short accounts. Even when I'm offended, my toes are stepped on, or I'm sinned against, I can actually throw all that to the foot of the cross. Keeping short accounts. Not giving room for Satan to keep tempting me and festering this bitterness and hatred, this nasty, dead, putrid life that so many live. Because he's forgiven me, I forgive. The gospel, listen, the gospel, and this will run through every message you hear preached here by the grace of God. We are laying out a gospel paradigm for living. The gospel is the new paradigm for our life conduct. It is not just that we are better people, more moral beings, but is that, that this gospel paradigm changes the way we see everything. It's the lens that we begin to see everything through. It's the litmus test for our actions and reactions to current events and current personal conflict and pain. It's the gospel. (laughs) The whole scripture is tethered to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So should our lives be. Would you stand? We're gonna pray.
Our Father, you are so good in giving us Jesus. Lord, might our lives, our interactions with one another here at the church, our interactions with our spouses, our children, our extended family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers and everything, Father, rightly depict your love for fallen people, rebels in need of a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.